Sweet. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. This is a complete honor for me to be here and speaking here. Uh, my wife and I have only been here for about a month, but so far it's been a really incredible experience and a uh, testament to the community and the, the folks that have been supporting the Institute for as long as they have. Uh, my name is Charlie. I go by Charlie unless I screw something up, and that's Charles. So if you use Charles, then I can start going back to my memory and seeing what I did wrong. Uh, we, we came from Arizona, very similar climate. Um, <laughs> like to do a lot of environmental education with uh, the species we had in the area, so a lot of snakes. I did a lot of work, uh, with, work with kids. Uh, we'd also like to go out in the environment and look for things that rattled whenever we could. Believe it or not, we had turtles in Arizona, so who would have thought? And then I really like to work with local groups. This is the Girl Scouts I work with, who are probably some of the most uh, influential people I've ever been around. And uh, really was lucky to work with groups like that and looking forward to exploring the area and finding similar folks. Um, but what I usually like to do is start by explaining the lab that gave me the most motivation to be where I am today. His name was Tucker. Tucker was tasked with smelling the poop of killer whales. Well, that's sick in for a second. All right, we're good? All right. So these animals you couldn't get within 200 yards of, so you have to get really creative with how you assess their health. So we would collect their poop. Um, Tucker was hard at work here behind a nice big old male there, ran transects behind it. And it was an opportunity for me to see an incredible species and then look through the data and be alarmed at what we're finding in their bodies or what we weren't finding in their bodies. Excuse me, lack of nutrition, if it was contaminant presence. Uh, it was really emotional for me to, to, to make that connection, but I think it's really important that we have that experience because it really does, you know, we have this, this kind of ability to take ourselves out of nature when we couldn't be closer to it. Um, I did my, uh, my master's and PhD at Arizona State University. I had a really diverse group of things that I worked on. I worked with engineers because they were way smarter than me. It's like, if I want to get better at basketball, I don't play with someone worse. Um, so I played with people that were much better and uh, did stuff ranging from wastewater treatment plant analysis to look at community health, did plenty of plastic pollution work. Um, had to get really creative during the pandemic and we actually create, I have to say, I, I, during my defense, they said, you have to say, I, I'm not good at saying I, cause it's a team thing. Um, I created the first uh, recycling micro factory specifically aimed at plastic that we generated from medical waste stemming from COVID, uh, which was a pretty amazing experience. And I left uh, securing a hundred thousand dollar proposal to get um, a, a summer research program for, for students from different communities that we normally don't see into the science classroom, which was really special. So I have very diverse background, lots of different things I'd like to work on. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not super good at talking about myself, so I'm gonna get really like, uh, I'll turn the color of my shirt probably. Worked on really interesting things. We did a study about uh, contact lenses as a source of pollution. Who would have thought people just take them out and throw them down the sink or the toilet? Turns out about 20% of people that wear them were doing that. Uh, so we did this study at a wastewater treatment plant which smelled, I don't, I mean, I can't even describe it. Like people complain about the ocean smell here. That's nothing. This, this holds the, the, the number one on that one. For whatever reason, it blew up and it reached all these different media outlets and uh, good, right? A lot of people stopped doing this and that's, you want good science to lead to, to changes in behavior. So we supported it. Uh, we also created a method to be able to extract microplastics from human organs and human tissue, something I'll talk about a little bit later today. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Again, we did that at peak pandemic and uh, we're working crazy hours to do so. Uh, we also recently did a study on those detergent pods. So if you think about those pods you put in the dishwasher or the, uh, the dish, dishwasher or laundry, uh, they, they are made out of plastic. It just becomes a solution. It doesn't really go away. So we did a study on that as well. Um, yeah, we get lots to talk about here. I've gone into a lot of crazy situations, not by choice. The camera tends to like me. It's a one-way street. Um, there's us up there celebrating that we got a really big killer whale fecal sample. And, uh, it's a win, you know, any win is a win. I was lucky to do a TED talk, not what four that Susan did. So, you know, she's gonna make me feel bad throughout this entire presentation because she's just such a legend and I'm way down here. Uh, I went to the state legislature multiple times to, uh, to state capital, sorry, to talk about the ocean. And even though we were in Arizona, we still should care about it. And they told me vehemently to take it seriously and we're kind of rude about it. So I dressed up as a shark and uh, got the point across. I, I work with plastic oceans pretty often on taking hardcore science and finding ways to make it fun and interesting so that anyone can understand it. One of the, the worst parts about science is that it can be such a one-way street and everyone speaks so scientifically that it just gets lost on anyone that doesn't have a PhD. 
Um, I had to do a photo shoot in a pool wearing a lab coat. I mean, I, I'm, my mom's watching right now, so I, I didn't almost die, mom, but yeah, came close. And then ASU decided to make a short film highlighting my research, which again, I didn't know I was getting myself into. It ended up playing during the Super Bowl. It played at movie theaters. I would leave the movies because I didn't want to see my face. It was very embarrassing. They won an Emmy for it, so yay in hindsight, but uh, months of therapy will help me get rid of that trauma. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we made the move to Blue Hill about a month ago. That's my cat who's very skinny laying on uh, our luggage. She, we, we managed to travel with two cats that are over 12 and they're both, you know, still with us and uh, they're making our lives better every day. Uh, my wife, Danny moved with me. This is Danny over here. She's been helping out at the Shaw Institute. Danny has a background in environmental education and working a lot with kids. She worked for the city government, so uh, fit in perfectly here. So we're here now. And everyone's getting emotional, so now I have to like turn it off. So thanks a lot. Okay. Um, so when I talk to people about Susan, I kept saying, I wanna follow in Susan's footsteps. I, I, keep, I kept saying that to myself. And the more I immerse myself in who, who she is, the more I realized I didn't wanna do that anymore. And the reason I say that is because Susan did the majority of her grad school career during a time when it was incredibly toxic to be a woman in science, incredibly toxic, super male, male dominated. Even now we're still trying to pick up the pieces with this, but you had basically three options. You could let academia drive you out. You could stay in your lane and put your head down, follow behind someone else, usually a man, and get your degree and, and move on. Or you would throw that box away, flip the script. And that was Susan, which I don't have to probably explain. Um, it's not really a surprise. Susan, as you heard from the video, was the first to do many important things. She was the first to document the exposure chemicals. She was the first in the water after the BP oil spill. She was the first to, to analyze microplastics in this you know, beautiful area we all call home. And when you're, when you're the first of something, it's it's not what it cracked up to be. I might have this idea and I'll come out and say, I think we should study this. And to me, it's new. There's probably tens, hundreds, if not thousands of people with a similar idea all over the world, at least. But what gets people to the finish line is it's what's in their heart and what's in their brain. And, and Susan had the passion and the work ethic and the resilience to not only be successful, but to be the first. And, and I think the best way that I can, I can honor Susan on a daily basis, and now I, we, my family speaks of people in the present always because they're influencing our lives, so they're very much still present. I think the best way to make Susan proud is to be the first, is to do what she did, and not just accept the science at face value, not just follow behind people, be the first, take that first step, and, and show people that even though Blue Hill is a small community, it has a big impact on the rest of the world. And, and I, that's, that's inspired me quite a bit. So I'm, we're going to stand on her shoulders and we're going to keep the science close to our hearts that were close to hers. And, and we're going to be the first to, to advance the field as much as we can. And I think in that way, we honor her. So. Now I have 15 minutes to get through this. Okay, good. <laughs> I'll talk kind of quickly. So this area is not immune to a lot of different threats, many of which you all probably know about. There's plenty of contaminants in the area coming from, of course, you know, human presence. We're dealing with excess nutrients in the form of things you probably heard like red tide or harmful algal blooms. And we also have things like harmful bacteria. There's a lot of, you know, agricultural waste sources that enter the waterway, can make shellfish sick, can make us sick. Um, it's, a, it's a problem that we're, we're fighting actively. So as beautiful as it, as it is out here, it's also got its uh, fair share of threats. There's also plastics. Um, I'm going to talk probably a little bit more about plastics today because that's what I did for my, my grad school research. And it's something that I think we can all connect with as being in many cases necessary, but in many cases, absolutely unnecessary. So we've all probably seen up to this point, the really depressing photo of the straw being pulled out of sea turtle's nose. We've also heard all the stories about whales choking on bags and passing away. It's a, it's a big deal. And, and we know a lot about macroplastics. These are anything larger than five millimeters, about this big. My background was in microplastics, very small things that we didn't know as much about, but again, can have a really large impact. Uh, whether they're being consumed by organisms such as shrimp, they're ending up in the beach. There were a lot of questions about how to deal with this. And it was really, really, really less understood compared to macroplastics, large ones. So the first question is how they get so small. I get this question a lot. Now, if you think about a conventional trip to the beach, you might see a lot of these items sitting there in the sand. You've got a little bit 
of a different looking sand here. Um, I'm glad you're all seated because I'm gonna bring in some graphics that generally make people fall off their feet. But these sand plastics are exposed to, what does he want to do it? Lovely, hold on, there we go. The elements, this is the graphic I told you about. It's very impressive. Um, <laughs> We've got the sunlight, which if anyone's been in the sun too long, you know, it's, it's painful. We've also got the ocean, which is very physical. There's high amounts of salt in it that can degrade things over time. And so what you end up with is a scene that starts this way, but ends this way. Um, I, as a scientist, I look at this and I see a lot of interesting things. I see colors, I see shapes. Uh, I see, I can kind of pick out things that I recognize if it's, you know, fishing net. Uh, one of the things that draws my eyes, I know it's kind of difficult to tell, are these round pieces. These are called nurdles. These are pre-production plastics. So they're melted into forming what we use today like this. This is done in a factory, a very specific area where they're probably being spilled and they're ending up in the water. But just a sad scene, uh, you know, tremendous opportunity for research. So as I said, we have something that sits on the sand, encounters uh, UV sunlight, physicality of water, the salt water. We've also got now microfibers. So, you know, these polyester clothing items that we're wearing that, that shed really easily in the air are contributing to the pollution issue. We have those nurdles that, that are, again, pre-production. They come small. Generally, when we have something big, it doesn't become small for a really long time because it takes a while. Plastic is really good at resisting degradation. So, so we have two things that become microplastics instantly. Um, and then we also have what we were using in soap. So we were using microbeads to exfoliate uh, thankfully, that's kind of being weaned out, but we're still seeing traces of it, you know, quite often. We're calling these primary and secondary microplastics. Primary are created to be small, just like your face wash. Secondary microplastics start out big, encounter something degradative, and turn into something small over time. What we're seeing is similar patterns. And so, you know, we, we talked about DDT, other chemicals. They can concentrate as they go up the food web. Plastics can do the same thing and, and in actually different ways. This is gonna look very sciencey. I apologize, but it's a really good figure. Um, this is sort of highlighting the routes of exposure for plastic. You can eat it, you can breathe it in, or it can go in through your skin, which we've seen now with really small particles. We can outline all the different toxicity, toxicity pathways, how it can affect you in a negative way or any animal in a negative way. A big interest to me was its ability to act as a vector for organisms and chemicals. It, it's, it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic in nature doesn't like water or really likes water, depending on the polymer. If it's hydrophobic, it will attract hydrophobic contaminants. If it's hydrophilic, the same way. Plastics have been known to interact with a bunch of different other harmful communities. There's research on bacteria, which we just talked about. There's research on phytoplankton. Again, that's harmful algal blooms. There's research on persistent organic pollutants, which is what Susan was studying so well. And then there's even pathogens like viruses. They're not only attracted to each other, but they're attracted to each other at upwards of a million times the concentration of what's found in the water. They're essentially acting, acting as a vehicle and attracting all these different things. And it's, it's an insane topic. And you don't really think about it with something so small, but because of their high surface area and their ability to sequester things, they become a really big threat to our ecosystems and to us. And what I'm, gonna, what I'm kind of trying to do here, and you know, we're off to a good start, is, is circle back on what the Institute was so vehemently researching. And, and one of them is looking at animals as indicators of environmental health, looking at links between environmental health and us, and then trying to protect against it. That's, that's really the three best things that we can do out here. Um, and it's something that we're passionately pursuing. And so far it's gone really well. Um, again, they're gonna hate me for doing this, but it, it does start as a collective effort. I want to acknowledge uh, Colby College because they were the ones we worked with to secure our wonderful interns. Uh, they provided, we provided the housing, Cynthia for, with her, her graciousness, and, um, and, and Colby supplied them with some money to eat, <laughs> which we didn't really want to do. I'm just joking. <laughs> we feed them very well. Um, so they provided those, and they've been wonderful to work with. We've had a blast, and I'm not taking it easy. They are working, they're balancing several projects at once. So we're looking at bacterial contamination in multiple sites around the peninsula. They're looking at certain uh, phytoplankton that are responsible for algal blooms. They're helping me with my plastic pollution research. And we're also gonna be looking at species health relative to climate change. So this is a big deal. It's our best internships we were ever on really taught you and groomed you on being a scientist while still giving the ability to think and understand and see things and ask your own questions. And that's the, the environment we really tried to create with them. And they've been wonderful. Got some really good opportunities to, to get on the water. Uh, we had to go out with the lobster fishermen the other day. We made a trip out to Bar Harbor to do a whale watch, which 
was interesting to say the least. Um, but it's been just a blast having them here. And we've been really, really excited about their presence and their ideas. And they've just been such wonderful workers and, and, and kind of friends. Like we're, they're pretty cool people. So um, as Susan said multiple times, there is a critical need to assess marine mammals because they are these, this, um, they are this, these wonderful indicators of ecosystem health because what they're consuming, you know, we're probably consuming as well. And one of the things I really wanted to get back off the ground was our ability to respond to something like a stranding. Best case scenario, if the animal is a baby, if it's hurt, such as a seal, you, you, know, you connect it with the right organizations such as Allied Whale, nurse it back to health, it goes back in the, you know, the ecosystem, everyone's happy. Worst case scenario, the animal passes away, which is, you know, it's, a, it's tragic, but every single animal tells a story in its tissues and its organs and every aspect of its being. And those are really critical when it comes to researching the health of our ecosystem. So, we are now officially certified to respond to strandings, and we're also officially certified to be able to collect tissues for later analysis. Again, something that Susan did such a good job of. And let me tell you, it didn't take long. <laughs> we uh, responded to a, a harbor seal pup that had stranded away from its mother and uh, was not looking too great. It wasn't in the, you know, the dangerous category, but it, you know, if it was out there a little bit longer, it probably would have become emaciated and dehydrated and passed away. Uh, I worked with Allied Whale to get the pup to safety, and you can see there's a pretty stark contrast between pup on day one and pup on day three, right here. <laughs> he now has a name. His name is Pepe. We're, we're very invested in Pepe at this point. So very happy about that. And again, I'm, you're going to see these things pop up in the corner. I've been nothing in the past without collaboration. None of my research would have been successful. None, none of the projects I was ever a part of would have been successful without collaboration. And I'm always gonna showcase the two groups that we're working with or the groups we're working with for a given project. Um, just because I think it's just, it's such a wonderful part of science. Now, we also have this phenomenon here of these birds that should not be eating, should not be eating things that they're eating. We've been seeing seabird species out in the middle of nowhere that have nothing to do with people having copious amounts of plastic in their stomach. And, and it's kind of been an alarming trend. Maine happens to have several bird species, I, you know, a plethora of bird species that are either endangered, threatened, special concern. And it's not a surprise, a lot of these seabirds come out here to nest temporarily at somewhere like Eastern Egg Rock. These are the places that they've been coming to for generations. They feel safe. They usually can raise their offspring. It's a really important haven for them. And, and Maine's got so many islands like that. Eastern Egg Rock is interesting because it's the island, the island is the host, is the home to the first restored seabird colony. Animals were introduced in the past, birds were hunted. It ended up creating a lot of these really horrible species numbers. And now they're really concerned about stuff washing ashore. They're concerned about the preservation of the species. And ultimately they're just begging for more research. Well, the Shaw Institute has now partnered with the Maine Audubon Society and Project Puffin, and we will create the first critical plastic research assessment of threatened seabirds on Eastern Egg Rock. Never been done before. We're going to be the first ones to do it. Uh, Audubon and uh, Project Puffin has graciously offered to take us out to the island, produce some preliminary assessments, do some research. Uh, we're very excited about this collaboration. We've worked, I've worked with Audubon in the past, and they've been a wonderful group to collaborate with. So we're very excited about this. I can't wait to get the interns face to face with uh, some cute puffins. Um, but yeah, very excited about this first or our subsequent collaboration. <clears throat> Again, another really interesting species that we have here that's kind of an indication of climate change, common sea stars. You know, we see them all over the place on a good year. And, and they're wonderful again to have around us, but they've also been shown to be associated with something called sea star wasting disease. And, and we're, we're, we're concerned about it. There's enough out there to, to basically link it to climate change and be able to say with warming waters, we're gonna see more and more of this. And, and these are keystone species. These are species that if they are taken out of an ecosystem, there's gonna be this trophic effect all the way down, big time disruption of all the other species in that ecosystem. Um, they're calling it a marine disease emergency at this point. And it's not pretty to look at. They've studied it you know, pretty extensively. There's been a loss of limbs, there's been a decay you can see here. <laughs> Lots of abnormalities from this, and it's only now kind of being understood, but we have such a wonderful opportunity to go in our backyard and, and contribute to the research as much as we can. Uh, so now we're working with the Scudic Institute to develop some sort of program to be able to assess this further. Uh, much like, you know, Susan uh, 
traverse her way through research. We don't really ask for permission to do things. We just go out there and create the research ourselves. So whether or not we, we have the, the resources at the time, we're going to get out there and we're going to start learning as much as we can. Myself and the two interns creating um, a transect plot so that we can start assessing their population status, their physical body status. And uh, it's going to be a pretty wonderful project. We're very excited about it. Another project we're excited about is Patent Bay and Shellfish. I love me some shellfish. So when I see this beautiful area and I've learned that it's been closed to shell fishing just because they're concerned, righteous concern about you know, the water quality, that, that you know, lit a little bit of a spark. And um, there's several pollution inputs in that area. We have the ability to test water. We have the ability to test tissue. We can look at the microplastics in the stomach. We can see if those microplastics are sequestering anything you know, contaminant wise. And now again, uh, we'll be the first one to look at the tissues and, and organs of oysters and mussels from Patton Bay in collaboration with Blue Hill and with Surrey. Um, and we're also going to correlate that to the water quality in the surrounding area so we can see exactly what's going on, exactly where it's coming from, and hopefully get it back opened up so I can go out there and collect a bunch of them to eat. Which is, I mean, I'm not led by my stomach, but I am led by my stomach. <laughs> Maine is a really special place for many reasons, but it's incredible to go out next to lobster fishermen and, and other folks that are harvesting seafood and they really are passionate about their stock remaining strong and the animals remaining healthy. Obviously that's their livelihood. Uh, so I wanted to go into this a little bit more. We had, we had talked about the mussels, we had talked about the oysters. In this area, if you go by the year, mussels are about $3 million industry a year. Oysters about $8 million. You know, those, those, the farms are taking off, which is amazing. Salmon, uh, $75 million a year. We've got concern about the salmon in this area. Obviously there's been some research that's been done, but folks are always in need of help. There's really healthy populations and there's really unhealthy populations. And we're gonna start doing assessments between the two to see what's different, whether it's their diet, whether it's their, you know, the, the local ecosystem, what have you. Uh, we got the ball rolling with that, but what's the big heavy hitter out here? What's gonna, hey. Right when I say something cool, it stops working. There it is. Good lobster. $725 million a year. One thing that the lobster men and women are noticing is that the, the larvae are having a little bit of a growth issue. And what should be normal for a lobster's development is not looking as normal as it used to be. So we started a collaboration where we're gonna look directly at the relationships between larval lobster and, and microplastics, which are thought to be heavily prominent in the area. Uh, very excited about that. There's a lot to learn about it, but um, you know, it, it's good to do the research. It's good to understand what, what's out there. And we're already doing so much coastal monitoring that just, just hand in hand with what's, uh, what's going on around here. People see us out in the field and they, they, ask, us what we're, they ask us what we're doing. And whether they're there with their family or they're there fishing, I think people are very aware that there's, there's threats and they wanna know that everything is safe to eat, safe to swim in. And we're just gonna continue that trend as much as possible. But yeah, we're looking at around $800 million a year in just those four creatures, which is just mind blowing. But the question remains, again, I'm just talking about animals, right? We're talking about us. So the EPA has got very strict guidelines on what we're assessing, what we're looking into, what we're considering to be threatened or threatening. Um, they are, they're interested in looking at children and, and older folks and folks with, with conditions that make them, you know, more vulnerable to, to poor health problems. And I got to say, you know, you start looking at things, you start looking at the fecal bacteria and plastic pollution and harmful algal blooms. And we see that we're finding evidence of all of this. We're looking into some of the primary prey items in those areas. We're looking into the bivalves, like the oysters and the mussels. We're doing water quality assessments. We're finding the same stuff. Then we start branching out and we start looking at the, the seabirds. We start looking at the marine mammals, you know, Susan's work. We're seeing the same thing, which begs the question that, I mean, I don't wanna know the answer to, but I do is what's happening with us. This is a huge field of looking at how contaminants in the environment affect us. And it's something that we started working on with plastics and that I wanna continue working on uh, with this project. This is a big one. Um, I was fortunate in the past to collaborate with a group that had a tissue bank, a blood and tissue bank, considered to be the best one in the United States, possibly the world, just because they were able to process things quickly. It was a very clean setup. It was very respectful. Um, they are very eager to learn more about neurodegenerative diseases. And they hear things about influxes of plastic. They hear about plastic and salt or in water or even environmental contamination when we're, we're out and about. 
we are currently in the process of creating the first study to learn at how specific environmental contamination affects neurological disease in human beings. And these, this is the most delicate set of samples I have ever been around in my life. It's taken probably six months of just coming to a consensus about how we're gonna do this. Cause all you wanna do is honor where the samples are coming from. We're doing this in collaboration with actually someone named Anna who Susan worked with in the past in Sweden. Um, brilliant researchers that have access to really incredible analytical methods. And we're also doing it in collaboration with the group that, that has the, the repository and that studies neurodegenerative diseases. Ac currently at the moment, we have access to a thousand patients every known age associated disease that you can think of, every organ, a full body autopsy, and the complete life history along with controls for each one of these people. This is completely unique in every way possible. And uh, we, we've gotten the ball rolling. We've gotten the green light to start moving forward. I'm incredibly excited about this. We're talking Alzheimer's, dementia, what have you. We have access to these, these samples and we're gonna go full steam ahead on analyzing them and looking at that relationship. This will be the first ever. We're hoping this turns into a multi-million dollar proposal over multiple years. Uh, we'll see, I got my work cut out for me, but I mean, always motivated. And then lastly, talking about safeguarding these areas. So, you know, we're, we're testing these areas regularly. We, we, we're seeing what's out there. Uh, I've worked really closely with the interns on developing a very awesome way of alerting the community about what's going on. We're doing a lot of testing efforts around the area, looking at things like bacteria and harmful algal blooms or looking at phytoplankton that are consistent with causing these, uh, these issues of people. We're able to go around and do our sample collecting all around the peninsula from Blue Hill Town Park to Patton Bay. Um, and really what they, you know, they came up with this awesome way of sort of analyzing the data that we've got downstairs in the lab with predicting what's gonna happen with certain weather events. Some of these locations have a stream and these streams are known to carry things that lead to you know, high amounts of bacteria. So we can warn people preemptively and say, these areas are safe to swim in, these areas aren't. And that way it's actively on display. We'll have it up, we have it up on the website. It gives people then and now you know, that data right, right there. And I think they've, been, they've shown a really great response to it. Uh, they'll start coming back to us more and more to get that information, which we're really excited about. Uh, we've got some impressive action shots incoming. So this is what the field work's been looking like. That's us out there practicing. It's really fun to wear waders. I don't know how, and my mom's on this. Why didn't I have waders, mom? I wish I had waders. We just went in, but that's okay too. Um, when we do our work with harmful algal blooms, it is pretty meticulous. You're going through and looking for certain phytoplankton species, which if you've never done it before, it's not the easiest. There are a lot of them. A lot of them look uh, alike, so it's been quite a process for them, but the interns have really you know, progressed and done such a wonderful job. And then when it comes to reporting bacteria, you can see uh, what we do is we, we give the bacteria food, we give them water, and if the populations double, you can usually detect it using, you know, black light. This is a pretty safe area. This area is, it's like a rave, and uh, this is, you know, a concern to us. There's an assembly line that we then follow to report it, make sure that it's safe, make sure that the town steps in if it needs to. Um, but it's been a really awesome system. Heather is here. Thank you, Heather, for, for giving us so much of your time and teaching us because we did things probably pretty wrong at the beginning. But now that's science. I mean, mess up. One of my past professors said, if you're not messing up, you're not trying hard enough. So I've tried very hard. <laughs> the last thing that's very near and dear to me is community outreach. And um, I was so impacted by environmental education opportunities I had when I was a kid. And then being able to have the connection with kids, with lifelong learners, it's so valuable for, for so many people. They think it's a one-way street where we go give a talk or we do a hands-on thing and it's just that group that's affected. But we become better speakers. We get more comfortable with ourselves. We get questions asked of us. I, I was just saying to someone, the hardest question I ever got asked or asked of me was, do killer whales drink water? And it was a five-year-old. I mean, I just shut down, just like blank. <laughs> a five-year-old. I, I still don't want to answer it, but we'll talk about it. I think they get it from their food, but don't ask me about it. Um, we, we are creating these activities as we speak that are very engaging depending on you know, the age group and the amount of knowledge of science. We're, we're making it all inclusive, but we're gonna be talking about all those tenets that are so important in this area. Plastic pollution, climate change. We wanna do guided tours and, and talk to people about the animals around them. Um, we are gonna start with a sensory table to get kids' hands you know, dirty with, with, silk, with sand and with crabs and, and all the other cool animals that we have here. Um, 
And we just got the green light to purchase a touch tank, which we have heard so much about coming to the Shaw Institute about how many people were brought in here because of a touch tank and how many, how many lives were you know, altered by it. And certainly the same thing happened with me, even at my age, I'll play with a touch tank. The cool thing about the one that we're going after is it's mobile so we can take it to schools. We can take it really anywhere we want and it's completely self-contained. So we don't have this huge headache of having to maintain if something breaks, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. So it's a wonderful community effort. We're going to have this started sooner than later, and I think it's going to make a lot of uh, a lot of kids really happy, and adults too, if you like to play with stuff. That kind of goes hand in hand with environmental education. Um, very, very, very passionate about this. I'm working with a group. So the second speaker, Todd Harden, he's with Plastic Oceans International. He's actually the co-founder, and they they have a strong passion when it comes to plastic pollution, and they they have this dynamic approach where it's a community-based effort, but it's a community-based community-based effort in communities all over the world. So at the same time, we're all kind of collectively working to improving the area around us, whether it's forests, whether it's ocean, it doesn't really matter. Um, they empower local action. They, I, I've been working with them for probably three years, and I've been blown away by by their reach. You know, they're they're doing things. They're doing beach cleanups in countries that are 30 hours away by, by plane, those, those waste collection sites that we heard about from Susan, they're passionate about that they're working on that. And it's just been such an impressive effort while also having that community impact. And, and, I, and I've just been blown away. And they've made a, a bunch of really cool films, which is something I'm excited to bring here. We're gonna do a documentary night sometime this summer. Uh, we'll show one of our you know, collections of or one of the, the documentaries that we have about the ocean, about climate change, about plastic pollution. We'll have some of the filmmakers call in so we can ask some questions and speak with them. Um, I'm very, very happy about, about that kind of relationship. Any time, any way that we can reach people, we're, we're going to do. This has been awesome. Uh, this recently just happened. We acquired a very specialized instrument that allows us to basically understand what any material is that we're coming in. So, so we've gotten to the point now when I tell someone I found plastic in the sample, they'll say, yeah, that's what happens. And, and we have to push the boundary and say what we're finding, how it's behaving, if it's dangerous, you know, is it breaking down? Uh, we, we got an instrument called an IR, we call it an IR for short. It shines a laser into something. The amount of uh, light that's absorbed is then red and you can fingerprint the material down. Um, and it's, it's an extremely efficient way of doing research. Uh, there's a pretty broad level in terms of how expensive they are, a big, big range. We went with the, uh, the 30K sample here, with 30K instrument. It's gonna be housed here, downstairs. So any type of nonprofit, any type of research unit that wants to collaborate with us and look at what's in their sample, they'll come our way and we'll now be serving as kind of a hub for this research. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a, an instrument like this, but it's going to benefit us uh, more so than I can really explain. What it does is it gives you a really unique spectra and the spectra is like a fingerprint. If I were to analyze something like seaweed, it would kind of look like this flat line. There's no real strong bonds in there for me to get any data back. But if I, if I send them something like PET, which we know, plastic water bottles, you get these really unique fingerprints that you can match to the, to the polymer library and say, yeah, that's PET. We can also tell how degraded it is. We can, all, we can, lead, we can link it back to where it came from. The, the capabilities with this instrument are, are incredible. We've been given approval to be able to, to pursue it. And again, very excited to have this in-house. We want the work to be done here. We want to be able to show people what we're doing. And then it comes to funding. So when I started uh, talking about the marine mammal stuff, it was suggested that I look into this Prescott grant, which is wonderful. If we're wanting to look into the archive that we have that Michelle and Susan brilliantly put together of all these tissue samples, we can start to put together you know, a, a plan for what we want to look at and maybe over the years of different environments with what contaminants are present. I don't ever want to spend money that's not coming from a grant or a proposal. If the research is good, if we're putting in you know, the, the time, we got the work ethic, obviously, we want to always be reliant upon grants. So we have to create this library, what proposals are available, what grants are available, what can we get money for externally. Um, we're going to be updating this very often. And I've already put a couple in there that we're working with. Uh, but uh, Michelle and I are going to have our work cut out for us. Every time you secure one of these, you get the opportunity to update the lab, to update the equipment, to, to work with more individuals, to take in more samples. And I got to tell you, it's not the cheapest thing in the world. So our new instrument was, was we got them down to 20 k $20,000. For doing tissue analysis with animals, it's $125 per sample. For doing human tissue, just acquisition, it's $250 per sample. The analysis is another $200 per sample. Uh, we have some lab upgrade needs that, that range between $10,000 and $60,000. 
And then the outreach upgrade, what we just recently got, um, this is all doable. And, and we just have to secure the funding. And that's what I'm working really hard on that previous page. Uh, you know, I want that to be a thing moving forward. Um, if you ever feel empowered to donate money, and you, if you're proud of the research that we're doing, this is what the money goes towards. So if I get a little bit more, that's another sample I can take in, or that's another area we, we can do outreach. I want it to be transparent as to where it's going and what it's helping to fuel. Um, lastly, I just kind of wanted to speak to the experience in Maine. Uh, I think the comment that we got most often was that we came from Arizona and Maine is a little bit different, obviously. Uh, I grew up in several states. And uh, if you look at these pictures, I bet you probably could think that they are Maine. Uh, they're not. This is where I did the research for the killer whales at Friday Harbor, Washington. Uh, this is a hike in, in California where I was born. And then here's a snowy road in Montana where I lived for many, many years. When I got here, I immediately didn't feel different. I didn't feel like I was somewhere else. I got here and I knew the woods. I knew the ocean. I knew the smells. I knew the trees. I, the animals were a little bit funky. We have sea lions on the West Coast and seals here, but similar enough. And it was just such a wonderful feeling. We've never felt like we didn't belong here and we never felt like this place wasn't home. And so it's, it's uh, again, we're very excited about being here, very excited for the road ahead. I'd love to chat with you all in more detail about what we're gonna be doing here. Uh, we've only been here physically a month and we've gotten a lot of good work done. So uh, I think, you know, within the next couple of months we'll have much more to talk about and much more to speak with you all about. Um, that being said, I want to acknowledge first all of the groups that we've been collaborating with so far. It's been a wonderful experience. Everyone has been so outgoing and so uplifting and empowering for us. And you know, we're trying to replicate as much as possible. Um, very, very excited for that. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Susan Shaw. You know, every day is, uh, is a new and exciting day here because we think about everything that she accomplished and everything that she expects us to accomplish. We're gonna be the first at all these things, just like she was. Uh, Cynthia has been such a wonderful part of this community, so wonderful for us to work with. Very gracious for everything, very, very you know, grateful. Uh, um, it's Again, this has never felt foreign to us. This has always felt like home. Um, the board has been phenomenal. So Stuart Shaw, he couldn't be here tonight, Susan's brother, uh, Matt and Vicki Newton, who just heard from Matt, uh, Dave Gallo, Greg Sundberg, Richard and Marty. Marty's been phenomenal as well, just getting familiar. Again, I feel like I've known Marty for 10 years now. Um, <laughs> This place has been myself, the interns, Danny, Becky, and Kurt, and that's it. You, you, you subtract one of those, you have one of those not be a hard worker and none of this gets accomplished. And, and so, so much of my gratitude is to Becky and Kirk and Danny for, for just helping me and balancing me out. And again, you know, three staff and all this has gotten accomplished. I wouldn't be able to do any of the research if it wasn't for them. So very great, very great, uh, grateful for them. And Emma and Sam, our interns have been killing it out in the ocean. And uh, that's not an easy job. The science is difficult, the interpretation is difficult and you have an influx of people saying, what are you doing? And they have to be able to kind of smile and say, this is what I'm doing. Um, Michelle Berger and her son, Sam. Sam basically, if Sam wasn't here, he's supposed to go on vacation. I know he's hiding back there, but if he wasn't here, this would have fallen apart. So thank you, Sam. And thank you, Michelle, for raising a wonderful human, but you know, very excited to have you here. Um, Diane, Bianco, and the Blue Hill Wine Shop, again, for making this such a wonderful evening. Uh, and so much gratitude to, to Blue Hill, to Surrey, to Ellsworth, people that are not only allowing us to call this place home, but encouraging our research. Um, and with that being said, uh, I'll be glad to take any of your questions.